idea is, what do you think it will take from either the Hollywood or the political scene to allow the political powers that be to become aware of what is really going on and the problematic situations that people are really, really upset about? Short and sweet answer. Uh, great. I, I, think, I think she's, you know, once again, a lot of times for all of us, these are hard things to, I, I can't say no, you're, not, you're, you're wrong. The truth is, is there's a lot of people that are hurting in this country for a lot of various reasons. And for every job that is made by tech, you, you're losing jobs from the people. I mean, classic, I went to Buzz in Televisa, and there's a guy that would lift a, a guard gate. And one day I said, well, why don't you get an automatic gate? They said that he would lose his job. And it was a, and I, was, I was shocked by that, but I said, that kind of makes sense. You know, it makes sense. And we're losing people to technology, we're losing that. And so, I think America, all America, is scared. Our, our, our future is not, we're, we're worried because the politicians that we thought were looking after us, across the board, mm -hmm. we woke up one day and said, wow, they really are politicians. Mm -hmm. And, but we forgot they work for us. That's what we forgot. So I think we need to inform them that they work for us, and these are our issues and wants, and too much corporations and big people with money come in and circumvent the whole discussion. There's no, there's no real answer as to what, or a, you know, a, a solution as to what people can do. I think it varies on, from the local level to state level to national level as to how and why people are hurting. So in LA, for example, there was a, the huge issue of um, uh, young kids not graduating from high school. And that's a very localized issue that needs to be addressed by the Unified School District. So whether it's, whether it's parents working multiple jobs and not being available at home, whether it's like the economy, like all these multiple issues come up that get addressed most effectively locally. I don't know why we always have this conversation every four years when someone's running for president. The president's not going to solve our day-to-day -day problems. Yeah. These are solved by pro these are solved by politicians and elected officials in your area. So to answer the question, sort of, for the gentleman earlier about the four candidates running, if you really want a Green Party candidate, have them run for local office, have them run for for uh, school board and city council or representative. It doesn't need to be a president. It could be somebody local and start there. I, I think you're right. The Democrats, you know, have, have lost a lot of the local. It, you know, they always say Republicans are great. But because we, we gear up for the presidential election, we forget all the other elections. Right. But they're actually far more important than truly to affect lives even more than the president. The We'd politicians be on the ballot for California are, are a great example of, are, of that. We'd be better off instead of having these two parties funneling everybody into one or the other. How many times have we heard in the last few weeks it's a binary choice? Binary being now has become a four-letter word. You know, binary is the word that the Trump people use to force you to vote for Trump if you don't want Hillary to be president. And then binary is the word that the Democrats use to tell you you have to vote for Hillary if you don't want Trump to be president. And they break the game to say these are the only two parties you have to choose from. And that seems to be what they agree on. And I think if we would have a different world if we had ten different parties on a ballot, we would have a whole different system. We don't just have two flawed candidates, we obviously have a flawed system for choosing our candidates. You know, this is, this is what we're lost sight of. We get so focused, me included, on the flaws of Hillary Clinton as an individual or the flaws of Donald Trump as a human being. You can talk about that and write about that all day long, right? You get lost in there, but the fact that these two people could somehow dominate, that Hillary could dispense with Bernie so quickly and so easily with help, and the fact that Donald Trump could beat 16 other Republicans tells you that that system's broken. Because that should never have come to pass. Absolutely. So we need to think more about the system that got us to this point, mm -hmm. and that's where real reform needs to take place. And it's also... Before, before my last time, but the DNC and the RNC, there were riots in order for them to be reformed. Like, what was it, like the 1960s? when uh, they wouldn't even allow for like a, a primary election. Yeah. It was like, here's your candidate, now go vote for him, or her, or well, him, obviously. Yeah. Democrat and Republican, now we have the primary system, which didn't, which didn't always exist. So systems can change. It's up to us to change them. Yeah, I, I, I remember an old joke just going to this kid, one person said, there was a Mexican politician who was meeting an American politician, 
And, he, and the American politician said, come here, look at this big computer we've got. We can tell you who the president will be within 24 hours after the election. And the Mexican politician says, that's not this. We can tell who the president will be before the election. <laughs> and and I, used to, I used to laugh at that joke, and I'm going, well, it's looking a little bit more like America now. Yeah. And that's the scary part. That's the scary. And even when Trump, and I'll, uh, is a, you know, I'm not for him, is like a tin pot dictator saying, I'm going to jail this candidate. It, it just, it just we're, we're, we're going back, so the system needs to be, be fixed. One last question? Was there another question? Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name's Eric Shaw. I'm an uh, educator and a writer and a serious white boy. So, uh, <laughs> but I've worked in the Latino community here for about 17 years with at risk kids and gang kids and all kinds of different programs that we've worked on. And my biggest question, because the point that I've always put across to the kids that I've worked with is that. Guys, you represent almost 35% of the population in this country. And you need to get together, vote together, you know, and promote that education, promote voting, promote, you know, all these positive things. And the biggest answer I've always got back from them, I said, why don't you do that? And they're like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, they don't listen to us. They don't do this. You know, we don't count. And that my focus has been to these guys. I'm like, you do count. As soon as you become a collective power, you count. Mm -hmm. And so my question would really be is what will it take to get that, you know, forget Salvadorian and forget, you know, Guatemalan and everything. It's Latino, like you said, you know. And what will it take to get those kids together and get them so they know that their vote counts? And they're, because I say, guys, you, you will determine your life, you'll determine the lives of everybody around you, you know, if you can collectively get together and have a voice. And, so how do we do that? Well, I, I think number one, I'll, I'll do a quick one, I think we all should, is that we haven't had the experience to, to see our votes count, truly. And I think a lot of Latinos have felt that either coming from other countries and stuff like that, or when they saw the political process happen, someone's going to die. You know, we haven't had that, that, the ability to see that our vote count. But I think it's a lot of part, part of it is that, that Latinos, as seen in the media, haven't been seen as powerful, haven't been seen as intelligent, haven't been seen as different ones. And after a while, we're starting to believe it. And I think guys like the, the Latino for Trump guy that believes there'll be taco trucks in every corner, I look at him and go, you know, Anglo culture is a very strong culture too, and if we're not careful, there's going to be Starbucks at every corner. <laughs> <laughs> we're there. We're there. So, I'm just saying the obvious, and I think we have to look at it that way. But, Ruben? Very quickly, let me tell you a quick story. Um, End of World War II, we're in Central California, and you have, um, you have VJ Day, and my aunt, Lupe, goes out and finds my grandfather, who's with my grandmother, and their three kids out in the fields. They have three or four kids out in the fields. And she comes out, she's in a dress, she walks out into the field, and she goes, Roman, Roman, ¿qué estás haciendo? No, no, ya se acabó la guerra, ya se saca. She's telling him, the war is over, what are you doing still working here? Right? Everybody's out celebrating. And he turns up and he says, it's a family story, it's been passed on the generations. He goes, Si, sí, Lupe, pero por los pobres, la guerra nunca se acaba. Yeah. Okay? The war never ends. And then she, and the war never ends. And she went, they went back to work. He was saying that for poor people, the war never ends. Okay? He, he defined the war not in the war in Europe and the war in Japan. In Asia, he talked about the war of the survival. War, survival, right? Survival. So, what I find interesting is that when you poll African Americans, they have a lot invested in the election. They say that if Trump becomes president, this horrible things are going to happen. And if you talk to you know, conservative white folks, they say, well, if Hillary's president, these horrible things are going to happen. If you talk to Latinos, they say, that is good. No matter who wins, I can tell you where I'm going to be on Tuesday. I'm going to vote on Tuesday, and on Wednesday I'm going to go to work. Yeah. And if they're deported on Tuesday, they're going to be back at work by Thursday. There is a bright side to that story. Latinos do not feel that their fortunes in this country rise or fall based on who's in the White House. They do not think that their, their success or the success of their children is tied to anything except hard work and sacrifice. They do not think that a president, no matter who the president is, even if it is Donald Trump, can hold them back. Now that is an incredibly empowering idea, but it comes at a cost because it means they're not tied into politics, mm -hmm. right? So they're, we're a little ambivalent. We're, there's just, that's what you can feel it. You can feel it in our community right now. We are ambivalent about this election. Even though we are strongly against Trump, 
we are never going to be in that camp. We're not excited. I, I, we're, we're never going to be in that camp that somehow feels that if we elect the wrong person, our life is over. We, it's, a, it's this Latino fatalism. Well, where you can trace it to Catholicism, yeah. you can trace it to whatever you want. We just do not feel like elections define us. We think our work ethic defines us. Well, it's also this. is We're not the, the Latinos are not the sleeping giant. We're the uninspired giant. And that's what's happening. I, I think to that is correct. <coughs> Um, I would say that it's, it's a multi-tiered answer in terms of seeing ourselves within the thread of the American fabric. So there haven't been any Latino moderators for any of the debates. It's been a huge thing within Latino media as well. And when I say Latino, I mean both English and Spanish language. Yeah. Um, the fact that you have Jorge Ramos, a top-tier anchor of Univision B, kicked out. kicked out, manhandled by one of Trump's bodyguards and thrown out and told, go back to Univision. Um, says a lot about where we are. And I think they just could go back to Mexico. Right. But it, it end up saying Univision because that's yeah. what we thought Mexico is. Right. <laughs> 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 um, and so we're constantly fighting this idea of, of being included in the conversation, whether it's political, whether it's media, whether it's Hollywood, to find ourselves playing the stories of everyday Americans. That we belong, that we're here, that we demand to be here, that we're present. Uh, and that's a continuous story. Right now, there's, I think in Arizona, there's like a book coming out on, on Mexican-American studies that calls Mexicans, and by Mexicans I include myself, because if you're brown, you're Mexican in the US, um, that says that we're lazy and can't learn, and you know, has a, the cover is, is of, a, of somebody that's like Aztec dancing, and it looks beautiful, but it's horrible. And this is a book that's gonna be taught in Mexican-American classes, wow. written by white people that want to portray a certain message as to who we are. And that's always been the fight. And I think for like young people, they don't see themselves. They don't see themselves on television playing, you know, positive roles. And, they're, and that's changing. Like you're playing a police officer. And the role of the... the East Emerald is playing a president. Who's right. Playing a president today, and, it's, and it's slowly changing. And it's, until we begin to see ourselves as part of the everyday American experience that has that's not because we're Latino or we're brown, it's just because we're here and we're present. I want to get to that point. I want to get to the point where it's like, if Latinos are the, the, the fastest growing majority or the largest minority in the US, when will we stop seeing our issues as Latino issues and simply see them as issues? If it's an issue that right. impacts Latinos, it's an issue that impacts Latinos. That's it. So mobilize and inspire and teach them and take them by the ears to go vote, you know, and, and hold them accountable to the fact that this is their country, this is our country, and the, and the future of it depends much of, like, what we do with it. How many people here are going to vote? Yes. Mm -hmm. How many people really are going to vote? <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many people wish they had better choices to vote for? Another question? No, Emilio had a thought. Yeah, I wanted to say something now, um, about this voting thing. Um, Eddie Olmos, Mr. Eddie Martins Olmos, uh, he put up a video two days ago, and uh, I'm going to try to say a little bit what he said, but watch the video if we can. He says, just go out there and vote. You think it don't matter who you vote for, but you vote. Because what happens when they see our names, Rivera, Sanchez, Velasquez, they see whether it's Republican or Democrat, they're going to say, hey, these people, they're voting. And what they'll do, they'll come and do stuff for us. You dig what I'm saying? So just go out and vote, man. It doesn't matter who you vote for. Watch this video. It's so, it's like seven minutes long, but it's so, it's so good. And like Mr. Edward Isles always does. You know, he's, he's, he's yeah, it's like, it's funny. He has a better voice, too. You know what I mean? He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's my, my kid's godfather. And it's funny because yeah. they, they know him as Uncle Eddie or whatever. But uh, I got to tell you, he's, he's a very inspirational man. And he's been on the stage. We've yeah. had Eddie here. And we're gonna have some great people coming up. Uh, Dolores Huerta, I can name off some you know, social activists. We've also got, it, it's, we have a great season for you. So please keep coming back, tell your friends, this is a program that belongs to all of Oxnard, especially this community, because you make it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. So at this time
time, they're gonna get their mics.